this episode, I am privileged to interview Sandy Viteri. Sandy and I met in an online entrepreneur group, but I had never really chatted with her, so I didn't know a lot about her story. I just knew that she had an interesting one, and I wanted to share it on my podcast. We only emailed and talked briefly before I hit record, which means I am learning a lot about the details about her story during the live interview. We found out that we hung in similar circles in our corporate careers, and our paths are very similar with how we got started, both starting as waitresses and then becoming receptionists and then working our way up the corporate ladder to vice president. It was really fascinating to hear how her midlife transformation begins with an unexpected layoff. We also have that in common, which led her to start her own business. It's funny that a common theme among those of us who have been laid off is that it feels like the end of the world. We lose that identity that we are so attached to. But as time passes on, we move on, we realize that getting laid off usually ends up being a gift. And that is how Sandy feels. What I also love is that Sandy talks about the process being a journey because what she did when she first started her business, which was two years ago, has changed. She initially created a business around her marketing expertise, but it wasn't lighting her up like she thought it should. Oftentimes, we find what we do in our jobs, even though we aren't skilled at it, isn't what we are really meant to do. We've usually gotten to that place in life because our logical brain is so good at convincing us what the right thing to do is and suppresses what our heart is trying to tell us. So then a layoff becomes an opportunity because it gives us a chance to follow our heart. I say this because this is so familiar to me because I spent most of my adult life listening to my logical brain. I love that Sandy was in her 40s when she starts letting her heart lead the way, a little younger than me. She was a marketing person, but what she learned in this journey is that there were things about marketing that she didn't really like that weren't aligning with her values as a person. And she started noticing that after she was laid off. So she decides to do something completely different. And what I also love about Sandy is that she didn't just go blindly with her heart. She wanted a successful business. So she did her research and looked at the statistics, which I was impressed by. And that research gave her more confidence in moving forward with her idea. I'm not going to say anything more or I'll spoil it for you. So let's jump right into the interview so you can hear from Sandy herself as she tells her incredible story. I am here today with Sandy Viteri, and I know Sandy from a group we're in. We are co-conspirators in launching businesses and uh, have many peers who do the same. And I thought she would be a great example of somebody at midlife who completely changed what she was doing. And she is in her 40s. She's a little bit younger than me, and she's a lot prettier. And she also speaks more than one language, which I don't. But she has a very similar background in that she came from corporate America, and she was a vice president like me for a big company, actually a couple of big companies uh, that AOL used to work with, by the way. And she has such an interesting job now of helping people create video podcasts. And since this episode is coming to you from a podcast, but audio version, I can probably learn something in the process. So uh, she has quite a story. And I asked her before we started recording to really go back to the beginning, because I want to know more. I don't know the whole backstory of Sandy and how she came to America and how she learned English and she speaks it very well. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Sandy, and let you just introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and for being here on the show. Um, so again, my name is Sandy Viteri. I am a marketing strategist. And you asked the question, I was like, let's go back a little bit in time. Well, I would say more than a little bit. <laughs> and um, I came to the United States from Venezuela um, over 24 years ago. I was 18. And I went actually straight to Washington, D.C. I didn't speak the language whatsoever. I didn't know how to say one single word. And at the time, I just came to learn English. 
So I used to put little stickers with names like at the door, at the window, and you know, at a glass of water. And I used to say door, window, like <laughs> just like that. And little by little, I started like learning the language. And six months into my visit to the U.S., I said, if I want to learn the language, I need to submerge myself into the culture. So I went and I looked for a job at a department store. It was Hex at the time. Oh, what? I remember Hex, yes. And I was a sales associate in the junior's department, just cleaning the, the um, fitting rooms and things like that. And again, I mean, little by little, then I got a job as a waiter, uh, waitress at a restaurant. And soon thereafter, before the year came, I said, I need to put my resume together and I'm going to apply for a corporate job. So I looked on the newspaper and I saw a post for a receptionist job part time. And I said, why not? So I put my resume together for the first time. I applied for it and I got the job. That's crazy. We have so many parallels because <laughs> I worked in the DC area as well. I was a waitress and oh, I wow. became a receptionist. Isn't wow. it a great entry level job, I think? Absolutely. And it teaches you so much about, first of all, how to learn everything from the basics, right? And kind of like walk your way through the ladder that things are not just given to you. You're working for them and you're creating your own journey and your own path. And, and you it, learn who everybody is in the company okay. and what all the different jobs are. I think it's absolutely, great. absolutely. And, you know, soon thereafter, and, and also it's ambition. I think is that ambition within you and not taking a no for an answer that, you know, after I became a receptionist, I, you know, I was already helping the CEO and the CFO of the company, you know, kind of like on a side. And then I say, well, why not apply? Because at the time the job came available, the executive assistant for the CEO. And I said, pick me. Pick me. I did the same thing for me. I went from receptionist and I, it was not, it was like the, we had the CTO. We had the CTO and the CEO. Yeah. So, yeah. so great. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I started working for the CEO and the CFO and creating, you know, helping them with the board meetings and creating board books and things like that. And at the same time, I said, well, I'm going to enroll in school. And I started going to George Mason University to study marketing, which was really my passion. So I was going to school. I was working full time. I was taking care of my mother who had cancer at the time and I had a newborn baby and I did all that and until I graduated and then I said, now I'm moving on to marketing. That's where my passion is and I started working in marketing. Wow. You're quite a story there and quite a high achiever. I mean, doing, juggling all those things and I was going to ask you, was it hard to leave your family? It sounds like your mom was with you. My mom was here, yeah. She, the reason why we came to the United States, she was working for the embassy of Venezuela, and she brought my brother and I with her. Um, so for us, it's like the three of us were family because my dad had passed when I was three. So it was the triangle. We were together. We were here. So, yeah. Wow. What a great single mom to <laughs> yeah. give you that foundation and have – you be so driven. So, okay, let's fast forward. You worked for these big companies up in Northern Virginia and you got laid off one day. Yep, I did. Boom. <laughs> that was a shocker um, because I was working for this company and I had been with them for almost five years. And it was a great ride, really good experience, amazing company, really. But the company was not doing well. Therefore, they had to lay off people. They had to reduce cost. Um, so when they were doing it, and I got the news that I was one of the people included because I knew other people were going to get laid off. But when I heard the news for me, that is kind of like when I said, this is a turning point for me. Like, do I really want to go back and work for the corporate world? Or do I want to start something fresh? And to me, I couldn't actually spend the time putting my resume together, looking for other jobs and do this at the same time. I said, if I'm going to invest on creating my own business, I'm going to go all in because I'm the type of person like I'm so driven that if I'm going to do this, I'm going to make it happen and I'm going to make it successful. So that's what I did. I said, I'm going to stop 
uh, building my resume or sending it out, I'm going to focus on this 100%. And let me ask you, before you got laid off, did you really love your job? Um, I liked it. Something was missing. Some, some, so for me, and, and I'm going to be 100% honest, I mean, I couldn't be otherwise, right? But the part that was missing, I was responsible for lead generation for creating the lead generation for the company, working hand in hand with the sales team, right? So it was the marketing, like the yin and yang, marketing and sales together to generate the revenue for the company. And it was bothersome to me to see how companies treat people as leads. Like it was part of my job. I needed to create lead generation and funnels but the people that you were talking to were humans. So the fact that they were treated as a number, that bothered me. And that is the thing that I am changing with my own business, that I treat every person by their name. I take the time to send an email. And I get it. I mean, when you're Coca-Cola, when you're Budweiser, when you're Nike, you know, it's harder to deliver that kind of one-on-one -on -one service but there's many companies that have been able to achieve that personalized service that today I think is so needed, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah. yeah. And, and to me, I feel like the customers like are created e equal. So in other words, like if we lose one, we'll just get another one kind of thing yeah. instead right. of like the loyalty that you don't, you want a life, time customer that's one of the things i could never be a marketing person because i saw that so i think that's such an interesting uh take from you and i love that because it, it it wasn't in your heart to be in that role and so you were being led somewhere else yes okay. and i'm a true believer that everything happens for a reason right so to me, the moment that I got laid off, you know, at first, obviously, it was a shocker. I'm not going to lie. I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And you start thinking about, wow, your salary, your expenses, how are you going to survive? And, you know, but then I thought it's all about me and how I think about what is happening to me. This is not happening to me. It's happening for me just like Tony Robbins says. So at that Well, point, and I think we also, we're a very title conscious uh, right, society. Right. And so you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I, I built my identity around this job and this job title. And when it's stripped away, it's like, sometimes it's like, who the heck am I? You know? That was exactly the point where I thought, because my next jump inevitably was going to be CMO right? Chief marketing officer. And that was my aspiration all along, right? And getting there was like within my object, I mean, objectives. But what happens is when I got laid off, immediately I was like, well, I didn't just get laid off. I got promoted. And it was up to me to make that decision and feel that way. And seeing it as a promotion and being able to do what I wanted to do is what allowed me to look at it from a different perspective as opposed to feeling bad about myself. Yeah, and I have a question for you because one of the things that held me back is I never felt like I could be my own. I mean, saying I can be my own boss is different to me than saying I am a CEO of my own company. Okay. And saying I was a CEO, I, I had a hard time stepping into that role because I was around, I, I would sit at the table at AOL with all men. Me too. And I was the only woman sitting there and they all had these real fancy degrees and I actually left college and didn't finish my degree. So I always had this, I like feeling like I was an imposter and I was, I got where I was through achievement, much like you. Um, and so I guess I, I'm curious what was going on in your mind as you made this transition because to me I was like, it was it was a really hard mental jump because I was still seeing myself as, oh, you can't do that because you, you don't look like the right. CEO type. No doubt. No doubt. And all those thoughts and feelings, because they're not only thoughts, but they're also feelings within you. Like I used to be just like you, like sitting at the table. First of all, getting to be able to sit at the table was such a big achievement, but it was also a big challenge. 
right? Um, and also especially me, not only as a woman, but Hispanic, Latina. So in, in, you know, my English is much better now, but it was <laughs> broken back then. And it's still, I say words that my husband is like, that word does, doesn't even exist in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Spanglish. I like those words. Those are great. Right. But imagine that in the corporate world, right? Like you, yeah. you're taking seriously. You're in a conference room with all men and you're trying to get them to make decisions, to follow your lead, to be the thought leader. And then they look at you and they laugh. And I'm like, well, that's not respectful. And you actually have to fight for that position. But I was able to achieve that. And I felt, you know, very blessed to be able to do that. But at the time that I got laid off, believe it or not, Lori, it was like a big relief. Like to me was like, this is a world of endless possibility. I can literally do anything. I have a white canvas in front of me and I can make it whatever I want. Yeah. And, and I see that you, you have seen that since you were 18. Right. Continually yeah. writing a new canvas every time you took the next step up. And okay. that's, that's great. Yeah. Well, we all have the pen of our life on our hand, and we are the ones writing our story every single day. So if you look at it that way, as opposed to life happening to us, but for us, where we're actually deciding every minute with every decision, what we're doing, how we're doing mm -hmm. it, and how that is going to impact us and others. We're yeah, and that's why I love people to, who like get to midlife, and it's mm -hmm. like, what do you, how do you want the second half? What's yes. what it, you, blank slate start yeah. over. And, but you, then you have all this knowledge mm -hmm. that you didn't have from before. So you took, and I love, I want you to get into the story of what you decided to do. First of all, you did a lot of research, which I think is great, but um, you took, I mean, what you're doing now is a lot of what was inside Sandy and, and that she was just bringing to the table. So Go ahead and talk about how you came up with the idea that you of doing this podcast video stuff. <laughs> so it didn't come to me at first. So when you talk about pivoting and changing your life all of a sudden, I think the best advice that I can give to anyone is just be open to those signs because it can happen to you at any moment. Um, so when I came out of, you know, the corporate world that I got laid off, my instinct was I am going to help entrepreneurs with their marketing. I'm going to bring the, the big marketing, fancy, glossy stuff to the entrepreneurs that don't know how to do it, don't know how to achieve that. And I'm going to make it easy for them. Right. So I started doing that and I got a few clients and it was going well, but then I had this feeling that. I wanted to share my own voice, okay? And I wanted to interview other entrepreneurs to find out the why, what was driving to them to actually create their own companies, right? So when I went on that path, I didn't immediately jump into the idea, okay, yeah, I'm going to do audio. No. To me, something inside was telling me that doing audio only was not enough. So that is when I started doing the research and I find out that, as I said before, 40% of the U.S. population listen to podcasts every day. So it was like, okay, check, you know, that's ticked. I know there is an opportunity in the market. I know if there is that many people, 132 million people listening to podcasts on a daily basis, that means I can get to that audience. But then I'm like, well, why not video? And I don't know if it's the stubborn on me that I'm always looking for the why not to try to make it a why yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I started doing the research for video, which it was completely, it was an area that I had never tapped into. I was afraid of. I was terrified to be in front of the camera, to be honest. And when I saw the statistics, like, you know, 80% of the internet traffic by 2022 is going to be driven by video consumption, I'm like, it's a no brainer to me. Like if you put the two together and then you have the audio and the video and you figure out how to split it into bits and pieces and like distribute that content across all the social media platforms, I'm like, you're going to get the best of both worlds. So then 
I actually started looking into how people like to learn. Okay, so I went more into the psyche, like the psychological way of how people, because of marketing, marketing this is psychology, psychology, right? It's like when you go into a store, it's been proven psychologically that people take a right as soon as they walk into the store instead of left. So there is the sales on the right side of the store are usually higher than the sales on the left. Like when things are placed on the shelf, they're placed strategically. So I came with all that background and I'm like, okay, so how are people learning? And I'm like, well, some people like listening, right? But what happens- I like, You know what I like about podcasts the most is you can do it and the audio aspect is you can do it like in your car. You can right. like, like you, yeah. it's, you can multitask. It's the, exactly. the king yeah. of multitasking. Yeah, yeah. And, and when I ask my audience, like, what do you like about podcasts only audio? Oh my God, I do it while I'm cooking, when I'm changing diapers and I don't have to pay attention. I'm driving and all that. And that's all people that are audio type of consuming, consumption people, right? But at the same time, there is a large part of the population that are visual, right? That they prefer their learning method, their preferable learning method is visual. So they prefer to watch, and that is the way that they enjoy learning. So these are the type of people that actually go into Google and type the how-tos, go into YouTube and type the how, and they take the time to watch the videos. So I started to put the two together, and I realized that if you do audio only, you're going to be missing a huge part of the population that like to learn by watching, by seeing, and then, Forget about those two for a second. Think about the people that like reading, right? That they prefer just to read. So I figure out how you can take the, the content from your video podcast, get a transcript, and then post it as a blog for the people that like reading. So I'm like, you know, it's, it's really the best of all worlds. Where yeah, and I just had this idea, this thought came to mind, and it, it reminded me that I should say this because – you can do other things besides just sit there and talk to the person. I mean, you can sit there and talk to the person, which is which is interesting. I mean, think of it Oprah style, right? Dr. Phil style. I mean, we sit there and watch them talk to people and, you know, they're not really doing much. But I was watching this one. It was a webinar and it was, it was I think there were like four people, which you could do on, a, you know, you could do a podcast with an interview, three people. And the guy who was heading it and leading it, he showed his shoe, and then every single other person that was there had the same shoe. Oh. And it happened, I'm going to give it a plug, it happened to be an Allbird, have you ever, do you know what an Allbird is? No. And I And I have like five pair of Allbirds now, so I mean, you, like if you think about it, I'm like thinking about, oh, I can make my podcast a video podcast now, and I can share my shoes you know because you can use it as like product placement type of thing so there's other utilities so oh, so there, cool right. yeah yeah in yeah. well, in not only like showing and telling i mean think about when we were kids didn't we love do show and tell it's exactly the same thing like you're showing you're telling in people that are visual enjoy looking at it yeah then, people connect with you when they see you yes yeah and there's a lot to say about that intimacy when you have someone, you know, up against your ear, but there is also a level of confidence when you actually get to see somebody's face and you feel like, oh my God, I'm connecting with her. Like, yeah. it's so reliable. Like, I, I, I can feel her, you know, it's, it's at a different level, I think, when you have well, that. Funny, when I have interviews, when I have my podcast interviews and people often say, is this a video interview? And I say, well, I don't share the video, but I, you have to be on video with me because I want to see you. Right. How can you interview somebody like when you're not seeing their like response to your question? So Lori, I'm going to give you a challenge. You are recording this right now. You could take the video portion and share it as a video podcast. Yes. If I had my makeup on and... <laughs> No, I will. I don't care. I tell my audience knows I'm super casual and you look great. So I should, I do that. You know what I do do? I do do, I take, um, audio snippets. Yes. And mm -hmm. so video snippets would work as well. And I love that idea. 
I could, I could, you really use your course, your program. I should look more into it. Yes. We'll talk about it. I'll add it in the show notes so people know where to go, but you actually just, uh, we, we use the word launched in, in kind of course land. Um, but you just introduced it, right? You just rolled out a brand new course yes. and That's right. you want to mention me. that and talk about that for a sec? Yeah, sure. Uh, so it's exactly that. It's teaching entrepreneurs, digital course creators and coaches how to launch their video podcast. And the main objective is so they can broaden their reach uh, you know, it's like exactly what you're going to end up doing and growing their audience. Because again, just think about this. If you're doing audio only, you're limiting the growth of your audience to people that like to listen. Mm -hmm. The second that you add video, you're broadening your reach and growing your audience into platforms that people like to watch, like to read. And you take those bits and pieces, smaller, macro, micro, and sharing across I mean, the usability of the content that you're taking and how you're splitting it is making you multiply yourself, is making you be more effective and more efficient with your time. Because literally, you're, the way that I do it, I sit down once a month and I record five episodes, I batch my content, and then those five episodes I split into bits and pieces that I use for over two months. I love that. It's like, yeah, you know what I love about podcasts is, and it's not, I wanted to do a podcast for uh, three years and I just, I didn't have an idea for a name. I didn't know really when I, I, I just wanted to like, I don't know, I have a gift of gab and I think I wanted to share my, and I've always been really open. And so I'm like, I just want to, and then it just like came to me last August and I just took it and implemented it. And I didn't even, the tech was a little overwhelming for me. So I'm just, I'm just going to go Facebook live and start interviewing people. And so that's what I did. So I really kind of started video and then I kind of reverted to audio. Uh, but what I love so much about my podcast is not only meeting amazing people like you, but I, it, I it's a way to connect with people. Like you were talking about bl the blogging before we started recording, she was talking about how kind of blogging is the old way of how we used to communicate. Now, a lot of people have podcasts to communicate. And I do like to write, but I much prefer to talk. And so for me, I would rather connect with my audience with my podcast. A lot of people have businesses that are, to they're not podcast businesses, but their podcast is kind of how they connect with their audience. Yes. Um, and so I, I just love the podcast platform and it's, it's, I love how you also, your podcast is a little bit different than what you're actually teaching. Yes. Yeah. And you know, I, I love two things that you just said. So the very first thing is a lot of people out there that want to launch something. Let's not even name it. Don't let's not give it a label. Right. But the one to launch, whether it's a course, a podcast, a video podcast, a YouTube channel, even an Instagram feed, right? The fear stops them from doing it, like overthinking about it, you know? And one thing I love about you that you just said is like, you just went for it. And when you take that first step, yes, it's like diving into a pool. But once you do it, everything you're going to figure it out over time you're going to find people around you that are going to tell you how to do things and they are going to give you feedback and and if not you're going to figure it out yourself but taking that very first step and saying i'm going to bite the bullet i'm going to go for it i'm going to do it you know it's like james says to us all the time like what you think the the police of the internet is going to come to you and tell you not to do it no who was going to say to me not to add video to a podcast nobody yeah. Right? James is our, James Wedmore, we'll have to give him a plug, is our coach. He's our mentor. So we, we have a lot of James-isms and swirling around our head. We do. We do. So I love, I love that you said that. But yeah, yeah, but I, I waited two and a half years. So if anybody's listening and it's swirling around their head, stop waiting. Totally. Yeah. Go for it. Bite the bullet. Go for it. And, and the other thing that I love that, you know, definitely one of the benefits of podcasting and even more so of video podcasting is just think about this because I'm all about efficiencies and effectiveness, right? So if you're thinking about growing your online audience, which we all need, if you want to make money 
and grow your business, you need those followers, you need that people, and you need to build that engagement, right? So what is better than you trying organically, right? But then the second that you do an interview with somebody else, and that interview is shared, you know, on their feed, on their YouTube, on their... Now you're no longer just tapping to your audience. You're expanding your reach to that person's audience. So think about the multiple benefits of not only chopping the bits and pieces of the video so you can actually show, but once you do those interviews and you promote together and you pollinate, you know, it's like cross-pollinate, at that second, you're tapping into an audience that you otherwise would never have access to. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing too is a lot of times people think, well, why would I want my stuff to be shared to somebody else's audience? Because then they're going to like that person better, you know? And I think the, one of the best things that I've learned from James is just the abundance and yeah. how the more you expose yourself and allow others to expose you and you expose them, the bigger your gift is to the world because, you know, it's one, we're not a, a world of one size fits all. And my gift to somebody who comes to me and I introduce them to somebody else is that I'm not their cup of tea and I found them their cup of tea. That is a gift, you know, and it, it will come back. It's like, you know, karma, good karma, and you, you know, comes back to you. So I, you always want in this space, and if you're listening to this and you're thinking about jumping out there or you're, you've jumped out there and you're scared to like share with other entrepreneurs, share with other entrepreneurs because the more you do that, the bigger, the bigger the pot becomes for everybody. I completely agree with that. And I had that fear too. And especially because where I was sharing something new that not a lot of people has been exposed to and it's kind of like a new market. I was like, well, how about if I start sharing this and people start copying and they get to market faster than me or they do it better than me. And then I realized, you know what? I really need to stop that mentality. And what I need to think about is the ocean is wide and deep and there is plenty of fish for everybody. And if you're not there, if you're not my type of fish, like you said, like if you're not my, type of, my cup of tea, that means they are attracted to you. They're going to end it up liking you because of your program, because of who you are and how you're serving them. And if they like somebody else, they were not meant to be for you. Let them go. That's completely fine. Energy goes there. Energy flows. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I love that. We're... Say that again. <laughs> energy goes, energy flows. Yes, yes. So um, that'll be a quote. Yeah. For my for my Instagram. Yeah. So I would love for you to share your thoughts because right now we're going through this kind of global pandemic, and a lot of people are experiencing either getting furloughed or losing their jobs. Hopefully many of them will come back, but it's a time of, I think, evaluation of like, do I want to go back to my job or is this an opportunity to do something different? And they might be where you were a couple of years ago. So what would you say to the person who maybe didn't love their job and has this kind of little inkling that, you know, this episode has maybe sparked something inside of them? Mm -hmm. so to me, everything that is happening, obviously, is really sad. Like, we don't want the pandemic. We don't want what is happening with society and racism and racism and all that. Like, we, we don't want any of that, right? But at the same time, it feels like a transformational era for everyone. And what I'm seeing, what I'm perceiving, you know, from friends, family, and people that are not even close to me is that, yes, they are a lot of people that are being laid off. There are a lot of people that are being forced to reduce their paycheck. But at the same time, if you start looking at all that, what is generating is for people to start assessing their current situation and start thinking about what's next. You know, what do I need to do? And just like you and I, it happened to us. It wasn't happening at a 
communal level. It wasn't happening at the society level like it is right now. It happened to us at a separate times. But the way I see it is like most people are at a pivotal moment on their lives where they need to decide what is my next step for the next few years. And honestly, because of all this, I've never seen a better time to go digital. Digital was coming, it, you know, it was obvious when, when the internet came out, when YouTube came out, all the social media platforms came out. But now more than ever, if you're not thinking actively about how can you digitize your products and services, then you're, and you're getting on board now, you're probably waiting too long. This is the best time. There hasn't been a time where people have been on the internet and on social medias more than ever, like now. So this is the time to, to go digital and, and get your digital course, your digital anything that you have, your products and services. Yeah, I so agree. And the one thing that bothers me about a lot of people that are my age <laughs> is, and I remember because when I started, I like when I was 55, I... I remember one of the first things I did is I had to create a Facebook group and I had no idea how to, cause I'd never even been in a Facebook group, but it's forget the like mindset that says I'm not technical because it is so easy now to Google or search on YouTube for a how to video. Yes. And I Google everything. I'm like, does, sushi go bad sitting on the counter i mean like any question because my husband likes to leave it out that just came to mind but yeah you know anything you want like i can google manuals of my oven that has been i just, i had to clean my oven and i never have cleaned it and i didn't know where the manual was so i googled it and it, there it was so there are answers to any question you have on the internet and you can figure you can watch a, t a video and somebody will teach you how to do it so if you have a brain you can learn how to do anything and i think the technology is so much easier now oh it is yeah but it, it could definitely be intimidating for somebody that doesn't have either the technology background or the marketing background or even the sales background like how do i do all this it could definitely be overwhelming but then that is when my advice is, yeah, you can spend all the time in the world, you can spend days, weeks, months, years trying to figure the one thing out, right? Get a Google PhD if you want to, but there's so many programs out there. There's so many coaches out there. Find the person that you identify yourself with and you're better off investing on yourself and on your program so you can get there faster than trying to figure it out yourself. Yeah, accelerate, accelerate. And accelerate, exactly. Yeah. Now, to your point that you were saying, you know, you can Google anything. That's 100%. But you, that is such a good point because if you think about Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, all the content that you're putting across all those social media platforms is not searchable. Nobody can find you. They're not SEO friendly. So you can put all the content in the world, invest all your time on having your business totally promoted on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Pinterest, and you're not going to be found. Put it on YouTube, hands wave video. So which one is the largest search engine optimization in the world? The search engine in the world? Google. Which one is the second largest? YouTube. Yeah. Owned by Google. So once you have your content on YouTube, you're, you're going to be found. Yes. I know I need to do that. It's on my to-do list. So I'm, th I'm very thankful for the reminder. This was yeah. the universe saying, you need to get your video out there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so, so much. And have fun with your new students. And we'll put your link in the show notes. So people, if they want to find you and learn more, they can do that. So thanks so much, Sandy. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm.